Good morning, everyone. You, you just heard that we're recording. That's because we would like to be able to share the slides and the recording with those who are not able to attend today. So, but I, I hope that's fine with everyone. It's, um, yeah, we would still like to have a lively discussion and, and a lot of questions. Although, um, it most of the the webinar will start off being a sort of a, a going through quite um, chronologically with an overview of what uh, is required for severity and pin and the GF. So. Looking at the list, there are a lot of our own people, but we have, it's nice to see that you're all joining. See more and more of you online. I think we should wait a few more minutes to let, to give a chance for some more people to, to join us. Maybe you could start with uh, some of you just introducing yourself in the chat. That will be very much appreciated. And I don't know if you all know me. My name is Astrid Holland, and I'm the Deputy Global Coordinator. I'm stepping in for Jennifer, who's uh, in Colombia this week. And welcome, Ingrid. You're one of our newest members of the subcluster community or the AUR community. I saw some of you online yesterday as well for the Save from the Start consultation. So it's nice to actually, for us in, in uh, Switzerland, to see so many of you twice a week. <laughs> um, okay, I think maybe we should get started. What do you think, Rufan? Shall I give a brief introduction? Or should we wait for more participants to come? We're now 27, but that of course includes our team as well. Mm, yes, I think it's 11 for it now. Maybe we can start. You think we should start? Okay. Let's see if we get done here. And then we have everyone join. I hope more people joining as we come. Okay. So a, a big welcome to everyone. You see on the screen, you see Rufan already. He's ready to provide a presentation. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words in that we've been analyzing the HNOHRP um, contributions from all of you last year, and we've seen a great uh, improvement. There's still work to be done, and we'll share the analysis and the tips with you in the next weeks. But I wanted to first recognize that huge effort 
Um, the analysis was done, was led by Rofan and with all the regional IMs and J as well contributing. And they were, I think many of you were part of the focus group discussions that also took place where we tried to really look at what has worked, what could work better and what would be the uh, required field support this year. So this webinar is really to kick off uh, around the HBC, focusing in on HNO. I'm very glad to see as many coordinators and I am online today because while it will be quite a technical, uh, so for some of you, you know, uh, focus and, and, and um, it might be challenging for some of you and that's quite uh, technical. At the same time, I know Rofan has made a, uh, an excellent uh, presentation for you all where she really goes through very structurally. And if you feel a moment that, oh, this is, um, this is complicated, remember you will be able to receive the recording, there will be more guidance. And as part of the, the last year, based on this increased need in the field, we now have Rofan and Jay at the global level. So Rofan is our IM uh, focusing on the HPC and all the HNO HRP guidance. I think you might all know her by now. She started in January and uh, she used to be the GBBI in Iraq. She comes with a lot of experience. We also have Jay at the global level. He's on the call. He's still working remotely from Taiwan and his Aria is more on the uh, GBV analysis, the analytical framework that we are revising. And he's now working very closely with uh, Jessica and those of you in East Africa on data collection and trying to standardize data collection ahead of the HNOs. So I think you know them. And then in each region, except Latin America where we are recruiting, we have a regional GBV IM specialist as well as part of the Riga teams. So. I think you know who they are. They introduced themselves in the chat. Um, it's Yosto in, in Cairo. It used to be Gurum in East Africa. He's now moving to Ethiopia, but Jay is also supporting and we've received some CVs already. So we hope to soon have someone on board. It's Adish Modho uh, supporting for Western Central Africa and Ajaz is supporting in Asia. So in case you're not uh, aware, those are the people to help you follow up after today. So today is more of a, a technical, like what, what is required in terms of, of indicators, calculating severity and PIN and going through the GF. In July, we will have a session where you all coordinators and IMs are also invited, where we will focus more on the strategic engagement in HNO, HRPs and the political sort of maneuvering that is required. Um, maybe just a last word. So I, we, I, we saw one of the things we saw in our very thorough analysis that last year you had 84% of the HNOs actually had a separate pin for GBV. So we've come quite a far way. It also shows the relevance, if you haven't been part of this before, the relevance of engaging on, on what we're gonna to present today. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Rafan uh, who's leading on our side on HPC guidance. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy uh, what I think is a very good webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, all. Uh, welcome to this webinar, and thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, this slide uh, shows the session outline. We will start with uh, an introduction to the humanitarian figures for GBV and HNO. We will cover the affected population figures and then we'll talk about the intersectorial severity pin and overarching protection severity pin. And then we will discuss in more depth the GBV sectorial severity and pin, which is the focus of this webinar. We will um, uh, talk in detail about the, the GBV indicators and the uh, pin aggregation methods. Okay, so uh, let's start with the introduction. Um, this uh, diagram on the right here shows the um, uh, humanitarian figures that are relevant uh, to GBV and HNO. Starting from the wider uh, circle that represent the total population, we have the affected population figure, and then we have in need population at three levels. We have the intersectorial pin, the overarching protection pin, and the GBV uh, pin. It is very important to understand what is the purpose of each uh, figure. 
uh, what is, uh, who is responsible to produce each and what is the role of DBD AOR in country at each level and how it is done. GB, uh, GBV team is very important because it can help uh, to uh, define the magnitude of the crisis. And once we have our team, it will be, uh, we will be able to work on setting the target for our humanitarian response, as well as the, uh, estimate the cost of the emergency response. But remember that GBV team um, does not, uh, doesn't mean number of uh, GBV incidents or number of GBV survivors. It is well acknowledged and known uh, in the ISA guidance and our guidance that in emergency setting, it's not necessary to measure the number of survivors or cases in each geographical unit in order to estimate pain or severity, because so often in emergency, there is no adequate capacity or resources uh, to conduct such heavy um, data collection exercise uh, uh, without uh, you know, posing a high risk of doing harm. And usually uh, GBV is also underreported. So um, the uh, getting uh, uh, pre prevalence representative data is very uh, difficult during emergency. So remember that prevalence or incident data is not a prerequisite for providing uh, or funding GBV response. For GBV team, we rely more on a um, risk-based approach uh, rather than uh, number of incidents or survivors. Meaning in um, uh, using baseline of affected population, we try to identify GBV risk or driver uh, in, at area level per an affected population group. And then we try to estimate the impact of this risk uh, on the uh, population uh, in, in that particular um, area. Okay, we will, uh, we will explain gradually the concept and the steps, how to calculate this pin uh, throughout this uh, presentation. But this is the um, overall idea, how to calculate GBV uh, pin. So let's start with the uh, affected population figures. You know, um, it's a subset of the uh, total population. Um, and it is um, the very, um, uh, it's among the very uh, first information requirement um, at the onset of a crisis. Uh, affected population includes all those whose life um, have been impacted as a direct result, uh, as a direct result of the crisis. And uh, usually identifying um, affected population is linked to identifying um, uh, affected geographical areas where, uh, where is an area population has been displaced from or to, or an area that has been specifically hit by a natural disaster like flood or cut off uh, from all access to food. Um, OCHA is responsible to provide this uh, information and it is uh, usually uh, comes from government, uh, other, um, assessment partners like DTM, UNHCR registration um, database, etc. This, um, again, uh, this uh, um, affected population uh, forms the baseline for any data collection to uh, inform uh, or needs to inform pin calculation for all cluster and intersectorial cluster. So this information um, will be used by all cluster as the baseline information that we will layer our needs information on the top of it and calculate our people and, and needs. The output of this, um, uh, you know, uh, figure uh, comes in this format. This table shows an example. We have first the area. We need to identify the affected area and the level. You know, usually it's admin two or three, and this is need to be agreed in country uh, unanimously. You know. Um, and then we, we, we need to identify the population group. Uh, we need this because uh, you know the severity of needs varies across different population groups. That's why we need to understand or do analysis uh, of needs by population groups uh, to be more accurate. And then we have this um, the number. So we have the uh, total affected population uh, per each area, per each population group. Okay, this is an example of the uh, baseline information that will be shared with all uh, sectors to be used um, in their pin calculation. Also, um, collecting uh, sex and age disaggregated data is very important to gain a comprehensive understanding of the most affected groups and their specific needs. In the early stages of, um, of uh, an emergency, this data can be driven from proxy um, indicators or estimates such as uh, population census pyramid, 
or percentage of uh, school-aged uh, boys and girls. As more information becomes available over time, these estimates can be refined. This can also be um, expected from representative DTM of, or MSNA, uh, household level data. You know, usually the, this um, um, multi-sectorial uh, needs assessment uh, conducted at household level, and they have a section that collect information about the family members, asking about the age and gender. And because this um, assessment usually are representative, so the findings can be extra extrapolated and a percentage of different um, uh, age uh, and gender group can be um, calculated. For GBV, this is very important, this information, because we know that not all sex and age groups are affected or at risk of GBV at the same rate. Uh, and um, usually uh, identi identifying which group a percentage to be included in the thin calculation is decided in the context. Um, and in consultation with all our key um, uh, GBV AOR uh, members and experts. Um, usually available data on trends um, in, uh, in response service provision can give some uh, hints or uh, use a reference to come up with this percentage. Um, and uh, usually the GBV thin um, includes or cover 100% of women, 100% of girls. It can include all boys or uh, maybe uh, or only adolescent boys based again on the available uh, data and uh, risks. Um, and uh, it also includes some percentage of men. It's very important to include the um, uh, male caseload in our uh, team because our response, it's not about only uh, uh, people affected or at risk of GBV, it's about people who, who will be targeted by uh, our response, you know, and part of our response, we have the risk mitigation and prevention. So a man as an um, agent of change uh, will be targeted by some activities like awareness raising. So we should include them in our uh, pin calculation to be able to include them in our um, targets uh, for the HRP. So it's very important to, um, to consider that uh, from the beginning and have this data prepared and added to our uh, baseline um, data set. So you'll see here in this table shows again the the uh, affected population figure uh, by uh, group. And then we have the um, uh, percentage by uh, gender and age group here. If we want to group them to the main um, groups like women, girls, uh, men, boys, we can also prepare it and you know, uh, have it ready for our pin calculation. So this is the first step in the pin calculation. Um, the next figure is the intersectorial uh, severity pin. Uh, the intersectorial pin represents the total population in need of humanitarian aid from all sectors. So all sectors contribute to this uh, pin. It is the responsibility of OCHA to produce um, these uh, figures throughout the intersectoral um, working group, uh, so, uh, such as assessment working group or IM working group. All clusters AORs uh, needs to contribute with indicators and threshold to the severity um, analysis and uh, PIN uh, plan. GBV as well, we need to ensure uh, inclusion of our indicators in this um, uh, severity, in the intersectoral severity plan to make sure that uh, population groups and areas affected by GBV uh, will be integrated in the intersectorial severity and PIN. The methodology um, used to calculate the intersevered, uh, intersectoral severity and PIN is GIAP, um, which is a um, um, joint um, intersectorial analysis and framework. In most contexts, this is used. It is very important for all coordinators and IMOs to familiarize yourself with the GIAP, but it, because it goes uh, for two reasons, it's, um, it's, it goes beyond the intersectoral severity and PIN, and it informs the structure of SNO. And second, once we understand how it uh, works, we will be able uh, to understand our role and how to effectively contribute to the intersectoral uh, process as well. GBV is cross-cutting. It can like uh, be integrated into different uh, parts of the HNO analysis and GF can facilitate this. So if we understand how GF is structured, we can also, um, help, it can help us to understand how to contribute to the intersectoral uh, process. In this, presentation or webinar will give you an overview um, on GF. And then, but the full guidance is available and we recommend you to, to, to have a look and, and, and learn more uh, about it. 
So uh, what is uh, GF? GF is a new approach to analyzing intersectoral needs uh, of population in crisis. If you open the guidance, you'll see that it offers a framework, tools, and methods to conduct. It's like a people-centered um, holistic analysis of needs by identifying the most vulnerable population, uh, whether they are um, uh, where they are, again, the affected uh, vulnerable population, where they are, and the combination of needs they face from all sectors and, the, and their severity. So key elements of GIA, we have the conceptual framework. If you open the guidance, you'll see it start with explaining the conceptual framework. And then the severity model, um, five points to a severity model. Uh, and then we have list of uh, standard indicators from all sectors. And then there are uh, the aggregation uh, three methods, mainly two methods, data scenario A and data scenario B. So this is for the intersectorial. We still are talking about the intersectorial and we are saying that it is important for us to know how it is um, uh, done because we can be inspired, we can adapt it for the sectorial um, calculation as well. And at the same time, we need to contribute to the process so it's important to learn about it. So let's start on the um, conceptual framework. As we see, um, the analysis in GF is structured um, by five main pillars, and each comes with some pillars. The pillars are uh, the first three pillars are context, uh, shock, impact, and this defines the scope of the analysis. Okay, and uh, the output will be um, again the identification of population groups, uh, geographical areas, drivers and factors, vulnerability. Etc. This is the output of the first three pillars. And um, if you open actually the HNO, one application of the GF, you'll see the HNO is structured uh, 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 as um, uh, this uh, framework. You know, so we have first, if you look at the intersectoral uh, part, you would start with the background of the context and analysis of the um, crisis and impact, and then we have the um, humanitarian conditions. The fourth pillar is the humanitarian conditions that. Uh, uh, objectives of this uh, uh, pillar is, uh, is to measure the intersectoral severity. We have three sub pillars here, living standards, coping mechanism, and physical and mental well-being. So the uh, humanitarian conditions for each sub pillar is analyzed and the output will be pain and, and severity uh, estimates. Um, the last uh, pillar is a forecasted needs. It um, look at trends and risk analysis, um, most likely scenarios to inform projection of trends. So again, if you open the HNO, you see one um, section for each um, pillar uh, for uh, the intersectorial analysis. The um, fourth pillar, you know, it's the, um, we say the output of the fourth uh, pillar is the uh, severity and pain calculation. And he, they will focus on this um, to understand our role uh, to uh, this process. So all clusters and AORs, including GDDR, we need to contribute to indicators um, to this uh, pillar um, to uh, be considered in the intersectorial um, severity and pain calculations. Actually, all the GF is reliant on indicators. So there are indicators that feeding each pillar, but because the fourth pillar is responsible to produce the severity and pain, that's why today we focus on this. And um, the uh, GF comes also with the indicator reference table, which is a working list of core indicators uh, accompanied by thresholds uh, recommended by global clusters and AOR. It, uh, all indicators are aligned to humanitarian conditions pillar and, and sub-pillars and a five point severity scale. So this table show examples from different sectors. We see the indicators and then it's linked to the humanitarian conditions and the sub pillars. So one of the three pillars, okay? And then we have the indicator, the, sorry, the indicators and then the uh, five point, um, uh, you know, uh, severity uh, scores and the thresholds under each. Um, these indicators, as uh, I, uh, I said, it's recommended by the global cluster and AORs. They are uh, still uh, not well tested and uh, context adaptation is uh, possible and required. So this um, it's not obligatory uh, list. It's only show example to help the um, field team while they um, decide on their indicators for the intersectorial analysis. 
So again, the contextualization is possible as long as it's, um, it's follow the GF uh, criteria. So if you open uh, now the reference table is available online, you can just click and you'll, you'll find the uh, Excel um, with all indicator. This is um, if you filter by sector, you'll see um, choose um, select protection and then you'll see all indicators under protection. Any indicators under protection can be used if you think it's relevant to your context uh, for the intersectorial uh, analysis. Then you can filter also by GBV. We have like 16 indicators under protection and nine tagged as GBV. And some of them are, um, are uh, combined with CV, like some of them they are GBV and CV. You will see the indicator name, their priority. We have like um, uh, first priority that, uh, that are strong indicators recommended. And then you'll see uh, one indicator under priority two which is um, not recommended if uh, priority one are available. So you, you will see um, uh, maybe later uh, you can have a thorough look at this list. Then we have the data collection technique. Again, we need to, to suggest indicator that, you know, when you think about indicators, you can um, propose many, but you need to, 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 to put those who are like, which are feasible to collect, which are available. So you need to, um, to uh, determine the data collection technique as well that uh, will um, be used to collect information for that indicators and what are the data sources. And then we have the thresholds for the um, five uh, severity scores. And again, this, um, this table shows example, indicative, um, uh, you know, uh, examples, uh, but you can decide in country uh, what uh, to use in, in the threshold. Even the phrasing of the indicators, you don't need to follow the same phrasing, but if you feel like you're, you have an indicator that can be linked to any of those uh, listed in the reference table, then you can do that. Um, uh, we show example, let me um, show you, uh, sorry. I, so, I have uh, here all indicators as you can see. Uh, we have this indicator, for example, percentage of girls, women who avoid areas because they feel unsafe. And then we can collect it through the household level survey. And then we have the threshold. We say if no, um, if women and girls reported no areas, unsafe areas, then the severity is uh, none or minimal one. And then you can uh, develop uh, the threshold based on number of areas or type of areas. So it's up to you. Okay, but here we are, uh, we are using the number of areas. So if they are avoiding one area, the severity is one, two areas, the severity is three, and so on. So this is an um, example of the indicators for the intersectoral. These indicators for the intersectoral need to be unique to GBV. We know that there are indicators um, that are associated with other sectors that can be used to inform uh, on GBV severity, but they are not um, uh, you know, they are not a GBV unique indicator. They should be uh, listed under the, the, the relevant sectors. So the ownership for this um, for these indicators will belong to the uh, relevant sector. So we cannot add intersectorial uh, suggesting the, the, them again because we don't own them. We, they are useful for, uh, to us, but we don't use them. That's why we can, it's not like unique contribution to intersectorial, okay? If you have any indicators, uh, like it's, you feel it's very good for the intersectorial analysis and it is not available in this list, you still can use it, you know, and please report to us a uh, regional global level to consider it while we revise the list for next year. So uh, we might add it and make it available for everyone as well. Again, this, is, um, this list was first introduced in 2020. We, re we revised the list actually this year based on the uh, mapping exercise for all indicators used last year, followed by a um, workshop in, where we discussed with key members uh, each indicators and we finalized uh, them. So if you feel like and it's based on field practice. So if there is, um, if you have other indicators that is uh, data usually available, then you can uh, uh, you know, share it with us and we will consider it, consider it in our revision for next year. 
So now we're done with the intersectorial. And again, this is all about the intersectorial uh, level. And this methodology is uh, only about the intersectorial. We contribute with unique indicators that meet the criteria to this uh, model. That's it. Now we can move to the overarching protection severity and pain. Now, because we, we fall under protection, right? So the protection needs to provide one figure that represents all, uh, you know, uh, AORs. So the definition of um, overarching protection severity and pain, uh, sorry, uh, pain is um, the uh, figure that represents the number of people in need of any type of humanitarian protection intervention, including all AORs. We have CP, GBV, uh, mine action, and HLP. It is the responsibility of uh, the coordination team and all AORs to produce uh, uh, this um, figure in the HNO. Our role, again, it's about to contribute the GBV indicators, thresholds, and we can collectively also um, agree or discuss the methodology to calculate the overarching uh, protection pin and uh, contribute to the joint um, analysis to agree on the final uh, outputs as well. The method, there is a no standard approach. We have a GPC uh, guidance now. It includes some set of recommendations and, and tips to calculate um, uh, this figure, but again, the method can be decided in country. Okay, so we, we, we but for GBV, we, we don't recommend any, it's up to you to decide. So we'll, now in the sectorial part, we will discuss different approach to calculate the um, severity and think for GBV sectors, but you can, um, you know, suggest it to be used for the overarching protection as well. So um, we will discuss this in more details in the following slides. So now we are done with the overarching protection. We move to the GBV severity and pain. And we need your full attention here because once you understand this, and this will be very comprehensive, you know, we explain the whole process, even the aggregation method. So once you um, understand this, you will be able, you know, to put uh, the pieces together and to have the full picture. And you will, will help you to understand also your role in the intersectorial and overarching protection. So um, GBV pain um, definition, it is number of people in need of GBV intervention. It is the responsibility of GBV AOR coordination team in country to produce this uh, figure. The method, first we need to um, decide uh, on the indicators that will be used uh, in the uh, pain calculation and their uh, thresholds. And then we have uh, two uh, methods for pain aggregation. Method A that um, uh, depends on estimating pain uh, from household severity. And the method B, it's, um, it's used estimating pain from area severity. Now we will discuss them in details and it's up to the, uh, you know, each country to decide which one is, um, can be used. So we're not recommending any, we're just presenting the possible approaches and it's up to you to, you know, use your judgment and see what is available, what data is available, and see, of course, uh, what other, um, you know, uh, protection AORs and intersectoral is using it, and try to be um, follow something that is consistent with the approach. Because at the end, we need the findings to be like consistent. We don't want to come up with findings that is like contradicting or different from other um, sectors or uh, intersectorial. Uh, uh, output. So we will start with the um, indicators. Again, the selection of indicators for we are talking about GBV, severity, and pain. Okay, so we can choose whatever indicators we uh, think it is relevant to GBV. So the GF limitations doesn't apply to uh, our uh, sector uh, figures. So this is our responsibility and based on our uh, experience and knowledge we decide which indicators can inform our uh, pin and calculation. The, but the selection will depend, on the, um, uh, will depend on the data availability in country. So, but you need to follow two basic principles that all indicators need to be available across all affected geographic units and population groups. Second, the indicators need to be able to show intensity of needs, meaning the indicators can be categorized uh, into different severity scales with given threshold. So you have the five point scale, you should be able to identify threshold uh, for each severity uh, score. 
um, we have the we have different types of indicators that can be considered uh, for measuring GBV uh, specific severity. This includes like indicators on drivers of GBV or coping mechanism. We have indicators uh, on risk and proxy indicators. We have demographic indicators like um, percentage of female headed household or, or, or female with uh, disability. And we have indicators on the availability of core GBV services. So again, um, unlike the indicators for GF, the, we have broader scope here to, um, to choose the indicator that we think will be relevant to us and help to calculate people in need. Now, some tips uh, for selecting indicators. Try to prepare your analysis plan for the GBV sectorial analysis early. Uh, map all GBV indicators using secondary data review. Try to identify gaps and advocate with partners and assessment actors to initiate appropriate data collection and assessment to address the gaps to have the, re uh, the data ready on time before you start the pin calculation. If there are like joint data collection initiatives like um, NSNA or CNA, DCM, try to um, suggest uh, indicators that can be included into this um, data collection exercise. We shared with you earlier a list of the uh, some examples of indicators that can be um, uh, included into the MSNA um, assessment. Um, we said uh, that data on incidents is not required uh, for pin calculation, but if you have holistic prevalence study, it doesn't, it's not wise to not uh, consider it. So if there is a good um, prevalence data, we can use it in our calculation, but it's not like using it as direct pin. No, it can, it can help us to determine the severity at area level. And then, uh, uh, and then we come up with an estimate of the affected population by this, um, by this uh, incidence. Okay, we will, we will explain uh, more uh, when we talk about the uh, methods and uh, step by step, and this will hopefully be clear. The, um, again, for severity, you already suggested some indicators for the intersectorial overarching protection severity scale. So you should have it also for, the, for your severity pin and uh, yeah, for, for the GBV sector of severity and pin calculation. So once you put your, you actually you start with putting your analysis plan, you list all indicators that you will use, and then you mark those that are unique to GBV and will contribute to the intersectoral uh, severity. And then. Uh, examples, again, it's, uh, you can find it in the GF reference data. So other tips, you can use proxy indicators. And by proxy indicators, like they usually come from other sectors, we mean um, uh, those indicators from other sectors on living conditions and access to basic needs that might um, uh, be interpreted to expose women and girls to GBV uh, risks. Uh, it can be related to shelter type, the site layout, the food consumption, or access to school. And um, we yeah, are coming from different uh, uh, from uh, different uh, sectors. Uh, this uh, data helps us to determine which location have higher risk of GBV due to living condition without having to ask about sensitive uh, and underreported issues. Okay. Examples of proxy indicators include, for example, uh, include um, percentage of households in critical shelters where GBV risks increase. We have percentage of households with no access to gender segregated wash facilities, percentage of households live under poverty line, percentage of households with acute food insecurity, and we have percentage of women and girls with no access to health uh, or SRH services. Of course, it's you, this indicators is based on the you know, uh, analysis partners assessment as well. If there is a linkage established before uh, based on evidence and previous assessment that, uh, for example, food insecurity can lead to some GBV, um, uh, you know, uh, can be GBV drivers or can pose GBV risks. So we can propose such in indicators to be included in our, um, in our severity analysis. Uh, yeah, we know that poverty, you know, uh, economic hardship can be driver um, for GBV. So we, once we, we establish this linkage, 
then we can uh, include it uh, as an indicator in our uh, pin calculation. Uh, we recommend to use needs, um, you know, indicator that can link to big humanitarian conditions, but if they are not available, then for the sectorial analysis, you can use cross-cutting or protection context shock uh, impact based indicators. You know, you remember the GF um, framework, we had the three pillars, we have some indicators uh, linked to the context and the um, impact, so for the GDV severity, you can use this indicator to, when you don't have needs indicators. Examples uh, of such uh, indicators include intensity of fighting in allocation or presence of armed uh, actors. Those can be, again, pose uh, GBV risks. More examples we have actually it's included in the um, GF um, guidance, Annex uh, 3. You can uh, see a list of all um, context shock impact based indicators from all sectors. Um, availability of GBV services, this is very tricky uh, indicators. You can find it also in the GIA. Um, this indicators is um, more on response than needs. But based on, again, um, internal discussion, uh, we opt uh, to keep it in the, uh, in the um, GIA list because the for protection, even CP, GPC, we, we consider like services one of um, indicators that can inform on it, but we need to, um, you know, treat it with high caution because um, they, they cannot reflect the actual needs of affected populations. So if an area has an adequate presence of um, GBV services, that doesn't mean there is no people in need. And if there is no GBV services at the same time, this doesn't mean that all like or, or people in this area in need of GBV. So if we have, but in certain scenario, if you want to use it, you need to consider also that some of these services can depend on funding. So you need to exclude them from your uh, from your data. So I highlight those those um, areas that that uh, will not have sustained GBV services, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, take them um, or um, and consider them while you decide the severity of such areas. If you want um, to use it, try to layer it with other needs indicators, okay? To, to, to have more accurate uh, data. Some context, again, because lack of data, they, they, the only data they, 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 they have, they, it could be this GBV services, so they can use, but again, be careful when you um, use this data. And it's not only case management, psychosocial support, there are also health uh, services. And this data should be prepared through joint service mapping with health. So you, you, you need to, you need to uh, map all services that are like, uh, you are sure that it will be available for like, like we say, for um, significant time. And then you decide the severity um, based on that. We will discuss more how to use these indicators when we talk about the method, but this is um, uh, some uh, general uh, tips uh, when you select the indicators. Uh, we, now this table shows some examples of the indicators that can, you can use for uh, GBV severity and things. You'll see we have indicators from protection and we can, we have uh, indicators from other sectors, okay? So again, for the sectoral uh, analysis, you can use um, indicators from other sectors. And if you decide to use indicators from other sectors, try to get to use those uh, included in the intersectorial severity model and use the same threshold proposed by the relevant sectors because they are the experts and they know uh, uh, how to, uh, you know, um, decide on the severity and the threshold for each severity point. So, um, and this will reduce the work for us as well and ensure that our output, you know, will be consistent with the intersectoral uh, finding as well. So we'll try to use the same uh, threshold proposed by the relevant uh, sectors. So we have here, for example, indicators uh, belonging to DBVCG percentage of girls, boys, women at risk of GBV. We have this one belongs to um, GBV, uh, percentage of girls, women who avoid area because they feel unsafe. The threshold again can be based on number of areas or type of areas. It's up to you to decide. 
Yeah, and uh, this this example from health is about percentage of people reporting they they are unable to access healthcare when they require it. This is from the intersectorial uh, um, reference table. Or you can have also like percentage of women and girls with no access to reproductive health services, and you use the thresholds. Just one last point before we conclude this part. The thresholds, there are different types of thresholds. So if based on the, um, the data collection technique, for example, this is household, if it's, this is household level um, indicators, percentage of girls, boys at risk of GBD. So you'll see the thresholds are based on the um, number of risk factor. And here uh, it's like degree, okay? So you have, and the output will have percentage per, per each severity score. So at the end, you have this data at household, and then at area level, you have one percentage per each severity score. You will understand more when we discuss the methodology, but just to uh, also highlight different kinds of thresholds. Other kind of indicators that like this, percentage of female headed household, can give you, if it's collected at area, percentage, one percentage per area. And then you need to put the percentage, like if the percentage like uh, is eight, then you need to decide under which severity score will fall. So the output, like if their assessment is asking the percentage of female headed household at area, they say, okay, it's 10%, uh, then 10% fall under severity um, or three. Um, this is, and, yeah, and other indicators, let me, um, let me check if we have, um, yeah. The same in first indicator, it is uh, calculated at uh, area level. Again, it can give you um, uh, severity score only. It, can, it cannot give you magnitude, like it doesn't, cannot give you exact proportion of household falling under each severity score, but it can give you uh, severity score only. I will discuss more when we talk about the methodology, but just keep it in mind when we, um, uh, we, when we decide on the indicators and how to, to calculate, uh, uh, use it in, in the calculation. So that's it for the indicator selection. Now we'll pause to take any question you might have on the indicator um, selection or other uh, parts uh, presented. Um, so please feel free to jump in and ask any question you might have. And I'm going to check the chat box. Um, I also also can- Up front, yeah. we have a hand raised from board. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Yosto. Thank you, uh, Rofant. Um, very nice overview, very good presentation. So thanks for this. Uh, it's way more clear now. Uh, my question is, um, when you have all the data available, right? Imagine you would have all the data. Um, which indicator would you then pick? Um, it would be good if there is some more guidance on, on that. Let's say, for example, um, child marriage and then uh, the girls and women that feel unsafe, right? So if you could pick which one should, should be picked, which one should be number one um, to actually give us a good overview on uh, people in need for GBV services. Um, it can be arbitrary, right? So if we would pick one of the two, yeah, it, it will give another result in the end. So it is kind of important um, to, to actually know this. Um, also imagine in, in different contexts, um, you have three different contexts, all information is available. One context might go for child marriage, the other one would go for uh, unsafe feelings. Um, yeah, then in the end, the result is, is a bit different. So I think it would be good if um, yeah, the GBV AOR could also advise countries then on, on which uh, option to take over. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ward. It's actually not one indicator. So we recommend to use from three to five indicators. And uh, again, if you have strong indicators that can inform on needs, you know, we have different type of GBV and they can, we can have different kind of indicators that can inform on these different types. So it, it might not be only child marriage. We have the other coping mechanism, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, type. So we can have other indicators. So we recommend to use from three to five. 
and then uh, you will will explain into uh, in the methodology how the um, these indicators will work together to produce the final uh, severity. Okay, so if and you you decide your indicators first, and then when you when you get your data, you can also look. Uh, we'll provide more tips on this. Like if some indicators fail to to provide um, like um, uh, meaningful data, like if one indicators give you the same severity, low severity across all geographic uh, units for all population groups. So then maybe at uh, when you work on the data, you decide you want it's not useful, so you take it out. Other indicators will really can give you this uh, variation uh, across different units. So then you can uh, confirm it and use it in your uh, pin calculation. But it's not you don't need to choose one or two. So if you have many and all of them are good, just you'll see when we discuss uh, the methodology, you can list them all. And we will, there is a mathematical you know, um, equation you apply it on all to come up with the uh, final severity. And this is the idea actually, is to come up with the combined severity that doesn't come from one indicator. So the more indicators you have, more accurate findings you will, you will, um, you will uh, get. Okay, Again. thank you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, yeah, Rofant, I was also just wondering for, for GBV that would be possible, right? But then what about uh, for protection severity or the intersectoral one? So let's say, for example, um, yeah, the protection cluster is asking us just to prioritize one GBV indicator. Um, for example, yeah, in, in these uh, cases, it could be beneficial, right? To know then which one to, to pick or what would be your advice there? Yes, um, yeah, so one is very difficult to decide on and they should not just put this limitation and all overarching protection actually ideally they should include all but if they decided to include only part of them this can cause some issues later like inconsistency, but for the intersectorial again, again you, you, you can find examples in the reference table and you see the priority, the priority tell, tell you that this is okay, this is a good one. And again, based on the um, data sources. So if you have a strong data source, you can say, and uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, suggest that uh, indicator. It's very difficult to, to decide at global level, but again, it's based on the quality of data as well. But examples, uh, again, you can find it in the intersectorial uh, reference table. Okay, good, thanks a lot. Yeah, and there is the criteria for the GF SOC. They are like um, certain criteria. So if you feel like your indicator fits in all these criteria, and it is unique to GBV, and it's really unique contribution to the intersectoral that is not captured by any other sectors. So this one should go to the um, to the intersectoral uh, um, analysis. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mark, for your question. Any other questions? Do we have anything in the chat box? Everything in the chat box seems to be addressed so far. This is great. So, so that means we can move to... Um, Mommy, yeah, please. Uh, sorry, I can't raise my hand with uh, my computers. So uh, thank you very much for the presentation and all information share. So I would like to find out more. Sometimes I feel a little bit confused concerning um, the difference between affected population and population in need. Mm -hmm. I don't know what is the difference. Uh, Sometimes um, I'm thinking that uh, uh, you can be, uh, Population in need, uh, you can have a need, you can be affected, but not uh, really in need on GBV. So I'm confused sometimes. Okay. I, I don't know if you can explain more. Uh, okay. So, okay. yeah, so we, we, we showed, you know, at the beginning, the different humanitarian figures. Like start, you have the total population, right? And then you have a crisis that we can impact all population or part of it. So you need first to identify the boundary, the boundaries of the crisis. 
okay, and and the affected population. So you need the first step. It's not only GBV; it's for all humanitarian actors. Okay, they need to decide the scope of the analysis. Okay, the impact of the um, the uh, crisis, and estimate the number of people affected. And this data will come from OCHA, from all you know, um, to be used by all sectors. So your baseline information will have a um, list of all affected areas uh, and uh, population groups and figures. So I show it here in the second slide. So this is your baseline information. So this is the first step to, but first step in pink calculation, but this doesn't represent people in need, okay? Now you're saying, okay, uh, there is a crisis in, in hitting certain country. It affected like three areas. These three areas, we have like people displaced in camp and there are people like accommodated out of camp. We need to come up, we, we need to get the figures for each population group at geographic unit. So this is our baseline, okay? But those are not in need. Now we'll have people in need. We will have people in need for um, intersectorial are people in need of different kinds of humanitarian aid. So this is the job of OCHA uh, uh, with collaboration from all cluster. And then we have the protection team and GBV team. Now GBV team, it's about our indicators that are unique to GBV. Okay. Now there are like affected population, but our risks also uh, facing them. So we need to decide on these indicators that can tell us what portion of affected population will be at risk or affected by GBV as well, okay? And this is come from the uh, indicators linked to the humanitarian conditions. And we discussed different kinds of indicators. Let me go to here. So you need to decide your indicators first, the uh, data that we will inform the pin calculation. Now in the following slide, now we stop. This is the first step. We will discuss the method, how to use data from these indicators to calculate people in need for GBV, okay? So we have not reached there yet. Not so far, we know uh, how uh, the affected population figures are um, calculated. Uh, we discuss the different indicators that can inform the GBV um, severity and pin calculation. In the following slides, we will discuss two methods. Uh, to uh, use these indicators and produce the pain figures. So if you be patient with us, I'm sure by the end of the presentation, we'll be able to put all pieces together and have full picture. And we will also share the full guidance later so you can take your time, look at it and know when you work on data, it doesn't make sense until you, you know, uh, have access to the Excel and try to understand the mathematical relationship between different figures, but uh, here we, 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 we hope to at least introduce the basic concept that will help you later to, um, to uh, you know, uh, understand when you have full access to the guidance. So we'll check, uh, we'll check on you at the end of the presentation to make sure that you, you, uh, you know, you uh, connected uh, the dots, okay? Okay, thank you very much. It's very clear now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, yeah, if I may, one short question. Sorry, I also cannot raise my hand for some reason. Uh, I'm Katya from Ukraine. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Rafan, what would you suggest for us um, when picking indicators? Uh, how high we should prioritize the um, comparability of this year's indicators versus with uh, previous year's indicators, because now it's high, like it, it's possible to change it, uh, the data collection for HAP for the better, I can tell. But then, I mean, it could be not exactly comparable with previous years. So what's, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think it's fine. It's, uh, we always can document why it's not com uh, comparable with the previous year, because now you have a stronger methodology, you have a stronger indicators, you have stronger data. So I think it's um, legitimate. You just need to, to uh, uh, justify it, you know, explain it. And I think it's a good point. If you have uh, this year better methodology, then it's again, it's increased um, 
uh, credibility of the findings, uh, provide more evidence, and uh, yeah. So as long as the it is explained, it documented, so comparability is not uh, should not be an issue. And this happens in many con contexts. Usually, even the intersectorial methodology change. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, um, for political reason as well, uh, decision is uh, made. So we need to adapt, right? And this is the purpose of introducing new um, guidance, just to improve the quality of data. If things went uh, were not very accurate last year, that doesn't mean we need to be in, stay with the same line, right? So it's a step um, forward to to improve our uh, analysis that will inform better targeting at the end. Is it clear, Katrina? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, here is Julio Pires from Mo Mozambique, um, working at Cap the Guard UNFPA. So uh, I see. Um, I'm starting to, to understand. I, I get to the uh, to the to, to to the meeting a little bit late, but I think I, I'm I'm in now. As uh, some of colleagues have asking some some question, I think it's good that I understand. But what I want to do. Uh, to 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 understand from you is that we used to uh, use the information that come from OCHA that is giving us, for example, people the IDPs, the, and we are for for calculation of people in need. We are using the uh, the HRP, which is the Humanitarian Response Plan, that uh, we have uh, 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 people in need from from for, for here. Uh, 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 all all the cluster here in, in, in Mozambique and Cap in, in northern province of Mozambique. So we are using that figures to to to, to find out the the people in need. But uh, what we used to do, I don't know if it's, is it correct. What we used to do is that we we use that uh, figures and then we used to calculate the target population using our MISP MISP uh, calculation NFPA MISP calculation. I don't know if uh, if uh, we will uh, talk about target uh, population on on this is is part of 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 the training or not but what we do is that we use the pin and then we look at the, our target population we use the misp to identify our target population i don't know if is it correct or if, uh, we will target this we will talk about this later or not over to you yeah uh... So today we're discussing the humanitarian figures in HNO. The target belongs to HRP. So, so we stop at 10, but the target is estimated in the um, HRP. But your baseline for the target should be the PIN. This is the whole purpose of calculating the sectoral PIN. So your baseline, you'll see now we have the affected population and then you have figure PIN. So your target should be subset of your PIN. It doesn't make sense to come up with a different methodology to uh, calculate uh, target unless pin your pin is feeding into the MISP, uh, um, MISP uh, calculator. Okay, so if you're using your pin, then it make can you know it makes a little bit you know a little bit of sense, but it's I cannot say it's correct or not un unless I have a look at the data. Okay. So, um, but as long as your pin is feeding into this uh, calculator, so I think it will be uh, fine. But you can share with us a sample of your uh, calculations and then we, we can decide together. But um, I don't know if you are able to find a better uh, way to come up with target, it, uh, yeah, it will be, uh, yeah, make, makes more sense. Uh, sorry, I don't know if I can. Uh, uh, the reason that we are using uh, MISP, uh, 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 UNFPA MISP to identify is because of, uh, and, um, and uh, our ta if you look at the pin that come on, um, on HRP, it's global numbers. It doesn't talk, for example, of uh, you, uh, woman in reproductive age, and uh, it doesn't talk about uh, Woman, uh, young adolescent, young adolescent girl, which are, is our target population. That's why we 
put the, that the pin on the MISP so that we can identify the number of people, uh, the number of women and girls in the reproductive age. And then we found the number of young adolescent girls. Yeah. So that's why we are, take the numbers that we, 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 we found on HRP, we put on the MISP so that we can identify exactly uh, a number of uh, which, which are our, our target on that population. That's why we are using that. I don't know. Yeah. So this thing uh, is also Pam, Yeah. I'm so, wondering because yeah, uh, uh, Pamela did a, a one pager on the sort of the use of of the miscalculator for GBV calculations, etc. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to put you on your on the spot, Pamela, but maybe you'd like to respond around using MISP to calculate needs. If not, you just say no. Huh? <laughs> yes, that's true. I think Rofan can perhaps circulate the initial document that we um, have discussed. So yes, uh, most um, GBV subcluster would refer to the MISP in terms of calculating for the women of uh, reproductive age 15 to 49, but they would use additional data in terms of other vulnerable groups. So in terms of adolescent girls, um, elderly women, women and girls with disabilities. So there are other um, items that they add on, on top of that women of reproductive age. Yeah, thank you very much, Pamela. And uh, please, um, we will explain also in our method when we cover method A and B, how to calculate the uh, percentage of women and girls of reproductive age, etc. And if you feel that the method is not covering your needs, maybe we can, uh, you can also consult the MISP um, guidance to see how it can uh, help you. We will share the guidance. Again, we'll try to uh, share it with our package uh, yeah, this week. So uh, for the sake of time, we'll stop here um, and we'll continue um, uh, with the methodology, okay? So my colleague um, Ayosto uh, from the Middle East and Arab State region will um, facilitate this part, method A, uh, and then uh, I'll come back to cover method B. Ayosto, over to you. Thank you very much, Rafan. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So of course, there's no need for me to go in again into the introductory steps that Drofan have explained very well. But what I'm going to do, what I'll try to do today is to explain one of the two methods that we as GBB AWAR recommend for the calculation of GBB severity and population in need estimation. This is a method that is estimated based on household level data set, which practically means that we are using household the household as the primary unit of analysis. Now, this method is one of the two and both are loosely based on the GIF, but do not mistake them for the GIF. These are adapted to fit the GBV context, are recommended to use during GBV. And of course, we'll have to test against discussions in country with the protection sectors and with OCHA. But let's say that ideally we'll, we'll, we aim to, to, to give you a, a clear step-by-step -step guide on how to move forward with the process. Now for ease of reference, what we have selected now are four indicators, three of which are taken from an MSNA, a multi-sectoral or multi-cluster needs assessment, which are the percentage of girls and women who avoid areas because they feel unsafe, the percentage of households engaging in a negative coping mechanism, and the percentage of households report that reported women and girls of reproductive age with no access to specialized reproductive health services. The fourth one, has been taken from an area level survey, an area level uh, data collection exercise, which in this case is DTM. And that's the protection uh, the presence of protection concerns slash GPV risk factors for women and girls in the area. Before going into the explanation of the calculation method, let me just spend one second to, 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 to explain the difference on that. As I said before, this method is based on the estimation of PIN with 
used with household as the primary unit of analysis. The difference between household level survey and area level survey is that this area level survey, they are not collected at household level. As the name says, they are collected at area level and they are collected most commonly through key informant interview. Examples of these, the most common examples of these are the protection monitoring as well as DPM, but that can also be sector specific assessment. But in this case, the comparison is possible and I will show you in the next slide how to do it. There's one thing that we have to note on this method A. We can compare and we can aggregate, we can aggregate one household level data set with multiple area level data set but we cannot aggregate two uh, household level data set for the simple reason that they will have different sampling size, different family samples, different families interviewed. Thus the primary unit of analysis will not be comparable in between the two household surveys. But let's go to the step one of this process. The step one of this process is practically that of obtaining and preparing the household and the area level data set. And what does it mean in practice? It means that we have to code all the answers that have been given into the MSNA, into the household data set, into one unique severity score per indicator. Now, again, for simplicity and just bearing in mind time constraint that we have for this uh, workshop, we will not go through the process of analysis itself of, uh, itself of the MSNA and of the area level indicator. But just bear in mind that we will also take care of that and that we are working on a guidance that will also give you tips and a step-by-step -step guide on how to actually analyze the two data set. For simplicity, we have just in this case translated the results of each household into one single severity score. If we take a look at area at uh, line number one, household ID number one, area A and IDPs in camp, we're going to say then that for indicator one, that specific family has a severity of three. For indicator one, the second family down below has a severity of four. And this goes for the three other, for the two other indicators the indicator two engaging in negative coping mechanism as well as the indicator three. So each one has been allocated, has been given a unique severity score. And just bear in mind that here, the unit of analysis is always the household. So if the sample size is 5,000, we will have 5,000 lines, 5,000 family, each one associated with one unique severity score by indicator always divided by area and always divided by population group. The second part to do would be that, of course, of analyzing the area level data set. And in this case, let's say that the process is, I would say easier for the simple reason that there's going to be one unique, sorry for the, one unique value by the areas and by population group. And as explained in the second part of the slide, the one at the bottom, we will have for area A and population group IDP income, a unique severity score of three. For area A, but a different population group IDP out of camp, we will have a unique severity score of two and so on and so forth. So now if Rafan, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. The next step, is that of combining the two data sets. And how do we do it? The process, it is actually very easy. Remember that I said that three of these indicator comes from the same data collection exercise, the MSNA, and that the primary unit of analysis is the houses. That means that we have this combination already done for three of the four indicators. And what we have to do is just to translate the findings of the area level indicator into those of the MSNAs. And this is done by with a very, very simple mathematical calculation. It's not even a calculation, I would say, it's an assumption. The assumption that we do is that each of the family living in a given area, let's say area A, and belonging to the same population group, IDPs in camp, will have the same severity score that has been found relevant for the area level data set. If Rafan can go one second to the previous slide. 
So if you take a look at the first line of the area level data set, we have area A, IDP's income, and severity three. Going back to the next slide. For household IT number one, two, and three, IDP's income, that severity for indicator four is simply repeated. And that's a process that should be repeated on and on until, of course, the, 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 the sample is completed. In doing so, you will have all the two indicators. You will have the two data sources combined and your baseline to then performing the next part of the calculation. What we have right now are four different severity, each associated to one indicator. But what we need to do is also that of aggregating such severity into one single overall severity score by family. And there are two methods of doing so. All of them, both of them very easy. In the easiest way, you are just taking the average, the average amongst the value of this four indicator, three, 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 and three. The average saying is four, it is three, of course, not four. <laughs> the average is three. If, and this is valid, if you are using up to four indicator. If you're using five and more indicator, the suggested way of calculating that is to take in the average again of the 50% of indicator of the half of indicator that yielded the highest severity score. So if you take a look at, for instance, uh, line number three, area A for IDP's income, we have four different severity, three, four, one, and three. So in this case, in doing the calculation, we will simply take the severity of indicator two and the severity of indicator one to calculate the overall average severity, which in this case is three. Now, this is called the Dean of Max and there's no need to go into more details, but if the concept still escapes you, just remember and let me remind you once again that this is of course included not only in the slide, but in a much more comprehensive guidance that will be shared with all of you by Thursday and will hopefully highlight all the steps and calculations that are needed to do that. Perfect. The fourth step, now that we have a single and unique severity by household, is that of calculating how many families, which is, let's say, an estimation of how much population falls under each severity score. And you do so by simply creating a pivot table in Excel. You have your families, each of them has been allocated, like we know that lives in a specific area. Each of them, we know that, 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 that belongs to a specific population group. So literally the calculation here is just a pivot table that relates areas, population group with that severity score in order to come up with a percentage for IDPs in camp living in area A's. We know that for instance, we have 11% that are under severity five, 25% of them that are under severity four, 27% of them that are under severity three and so on and so forth. Bear in mind these percentages, which usually and always, like if summed up, make up to 100% of the population, because they will form the basis for then the final step of the PIN calculation, which is the translation of such percentages and number. Going into the next slide. Now, I know that this table seems to be very packed with numbers. But Rofan has well explained to you that we now have our population figures. And it's the green part on the left side of the table, total affected population. I'm going to take for ease of reference just the first line, I line A, where uh, with IDP's income living in area A, which total affected population is 10,000. We know because we have just calculated this that 11 of them. 11% of these 10,000 people fall under severity five, 25% under severity four, and 27% under severity three. So what we have to do first is we have to bear in mind is that for the calculation of PIN, we only and always take into consideration people falling under category severity three to five, and not one or two ideally. And second is that we need to simply make a calculation we multiply 10,000, which is the total affected population, times the percentage of people 
falling under E severity, which is 1100 for severity 5, 2500 for severity 4, 2700 for severity 3, making up a total of 6,300 people affected. Now there's the next part to do. And again, I'm relating back to the explanation that Rufant has given on the importance of having sex and gender uh, age disaggregated data. So in the first part of the table, you will also see that we know how many of these 10,000, which have now become 6,300, are women, how many girls, how many men, and how many boys. So the next part would be then that of multiplying the final value, which is 6,300, times the percentage of women in the population, which is 6,300 times 25%. And we know that as GBV, we usually take into account 100% of women and girls in our caseload, but only one proportion of men and boys. So meaning that not only we have to multiply the total people per severity, three, four, and five, times the percentage of women, girls, men, and boys, but we also have to multiply the value by the amount, by the percentage of caseload that we want to consider for GBP. Meaning that out of the 6,300, we know that 25% of them, which, it, which is 15,017, which is 1,575, are women. But we only know, but we also know that only 378 of men because despite accounting for 30% of the total, we will only take into consideration 20% of them for the, for the calculation of our GDP team. And this is an operation that has to be repeated for all areas and all population group up until coming out with an estimation of PIN that is sex and gender, uh, uh, sex and age disaggregated. IDP uh, population group disaggregated as well as area disaggregated, and which you can see in the purple, in the purple and red highlighted area down in the bottom. Now this explanation finishes, let's say, the mathematical calculation, but to some extent it is also uh, it has to be let's say compensated. It has to be confirmed by two extra steps. Step six is the review, interpretation, and adjustment of this estimation. And this should ideally be done with expert judgment and joint analysis. So the review and adjustment of this should only be done, not should be done not only within the GDP sector, not only with GDP partners, but also and most but also and importantly with protection actors, including that of the other AORs, and should be done ideally in a session, in a joint session where everyone has the possibility to discuss the findings. This is particularly important because it may be the case that some of our pin in specific areas and for a specific population group are higher than protection pin and are higher than the intersectoral population in each figures. Well, it is not necessarily true. It may happen or it may not happen. But in, this, but in this case, we must be aware that to solve this discrepancy, the only way, there's no fixed methodology, and the only way to do so is by discussing. That can be easily done, discussing with protection, discussing within the protection sector. But it goes to another level when we're talking about a discrepancy with, with the intersectoral pin estimation. In this case, we have two ways of solving them. If we know, and if there is a very, very good case for GBV to have a higher pin than the intersectoral, then in that case, the only thing that we can do is to just confirm and discuss and joint analyze the findings with OCHA and the other actor. But in all the other cases, the best, adjudgment, uh, the best adjustment of figures is done manually without the need to change all the methodology and the calculation done so far, but just focusing and targeting your, adjust, uh, your adjustment to those areas and uh, um, points where you have discrepancies. I'm gonna stop here because I know that we're running out of time and there's one more presentation to do, but I hope that this was clear and I'm very open to questions. If, not, if, you don't, if you do not want to ask them now, you can just type in the chat box and I'll be able to reply them. Yosto, thank there's thank you, Yosto. There's a question uh, from Elke around the risk of double counting or not. 
in the chat. Oh. Do you want to take it now or? I, I haven't seen the chat box, so let me, let me check. She says, what is your age bracket for girls? If we use uh, WRA, we include women, oh God. I, well, let's the, say that, let's say- Women of reproductive of age, sorry, I just lost it. We include <laughs> 15 to 49. So it's usually that's that's very that's very very uh, I, I mean it depends a lot on the baseline figures that are provided by OCHA. So like the age brackets is always an estimation, the best possible estimation based on the data available. So not necessarily it is possible to have 15 to 49 years old women in reproductive age. Usually the most standard, and that's based on my experience, the most standard division, even though I know I know that for planning programming purpose, a higher breakdown should be needed, is that of girls 0 to 18 women, 19 to 59. 19 to 59 and sometimes involving also 60 plus now OCHA and usually provide these basic four categories in some cases especially when we have to do the comparison with different population group uh, it's kind of uh, how, how, how can I put it in some cases there is data on the elderly available. And in some cases, as it is in this one that Rofan has shown, the population has been broken down into a further age bracket, which is May, which is 0 to 11, 12 to 17, 18 to 59, and 60 plus. Now, again, this may be a possibility, but unfortunately, there is not a standard approach. There are recommendations, of course, but there is not a standard approach. I would say that it's primarily based on data availability in country and the agreement, as well as on the uh, comparability of uh, sex and uh, age disaggregated data between population groups, because we may have that for IDPs in camp, we may have that for returnees, but we may not have the same for refugees, for instance, migrants or uh, host community. So the evaluation has to be made uh, when we have such figures on. And I hope this reply to, to the question. I'm not sure if there was another one on double counting, but I'll be able to, to take it. Sorry, I, I cannot see the, the chat box now. Thank you, Yosto. I think it's all clear. Thank you. Okay. I think we have a hand raised as well. Is it worth? Yes, correct. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Yosto, for this presentation. Very good. Um, just a quick question on the averaging, right? Uh, I think you can go to the next slide or the slide after. I'm just uh, wondering on, on, on the rounding. So I think, for example, you said three plus four, and then the average becomes three, but the average of three plus four is 3.5. So uh, how, how would you do this? You round down or up or I mean, well, if you pick three, it means you, you round it down, right? That's a very good question because we were discussing just yesterday. <laughs> So okay. let's say I will go. I will go with the official recommendation. I will go with the official recommendation, the one that we discussed yesterday. So the rounding should always be done up, regardless of what the value is. So if you have an average of 3.1, 3.2, even if that is closer to to three than it is to four, the rounding should be done up to four. And that's based on expert judgment, that's based on discussion and field testing that has been done by JF colleagues, as well as protection, uh, as well as protection, global clusters, etc. So it has been found out that it's been always that that's always better to round the value up, regardless of what is the decimal place that comes out of the average. So if you have four and three, the rounding should be four, and that's the mistake in the in the presentation. If you have three, 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 and four, the rounding should always be four again. So just round up. Does okay. it reply to your Yes, question? very much. And then just a, a quick, uh, another quick question. Um, so it says the mean of, of maximum 50% of the indicators. So 
you're picking indicator one and two in this example, but would it be possible to pick also other indicators, let's say two and three, or how does that work? Or you just pick the, the, the ones that are put first? No, 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 no. Uh, so I, I, I picked indicator one and two for the simple reason that they have the highest severity. So usually ah, okay. you do the mean of maximum 50%, where this 50% of indicator are the 50%, the half of indicator with the highest severity value. So if you have two, four indicator, two of them have a severity of three, and the other two of them have a severity of four and five, you always pick the indicators that have severity four and five. Okay, well understood. Thanks. Yeah, just one addition word: fifty of max uh, or mean of fifty. Mean of max fifty is when you have more than four indicators. In our case, we have only four indicators. We take simply the average and we round up. But if you have like eight indicators, so you can take uh, the mean of the highest uh, four. Okay, and okay. so on. And for the roundup, just one addition also, this is again based on um, DF um, recommendation. They did a lot of uh, test run on many data set samples and they come up with this, that it's better to round it up, okay? You can check the guidance and you'll, you'll find it there. Okay, sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Any so other I, questions? I think that there is another hand raised from Roger. Yes. A lot for fun. Hi, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I really uh, appreciate the presentation uh, because it's uh, really uh, understandable. And uh, I really <clears throat> uh, like the methodology related with uh, how those unit organization, the first methodology. But I have a question just to understand uh, because as uh, step three, you say aggregation all indicator to estimate the final. I, I, I also see the methodology. My question is that uh, due to the fact that you can have many methodology, what is the rationale to, to rationale to use these methodologies uh, just to take the, the mean of max? Because most of the time, for example, in GSC, you discover that sometimes when you are using the max, it can, it can conduct you to, to, uh, to overestimate the, the, the person in need. And uh, last year, for example, you use another methodology uh, with uh, Varimax. And the Varimax is a methodology who help us to combine, to have a composite indicators. In, uh, uh, in in that way, you giving some width to each uh, to each indicator in such a way that at the end of the process, you can you can derive with the final score who were really uh, compared to the judgment aspect. It really uh, 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 link to the reality. I don't know if you already do that kind of analysis to also have many scenario to really estimate the, the, the robustness of the methodology. Thank you very much. And that's a very, very relevant question. And um, to some extent, again, it goes back to the discussion that we had yesterday. So let, let, let's say that this one is a recommendation. So it should ideally be used, but that does not discount the fact that there may be practices and discussion at field level that go somewhere in another direction, including the practice that you use. Now, in a general, like generally saying, this maximum of 50% should only be used if you have selected more than four indicator, which to some extent also mitigate the possibility of overestimating of over, overestimating the team. And let's based on my experience, but again, my experience is very you know, like it's limited to one region. It's not that common to have more than four indicators into calculating uh, the severity, meaning that as long as you use the average, the average is sort of a safe way. But again, I do not and I cannot say 
that the way that you have used the methodology that you have used at field level is wrong because that again is based on context is based on your reality on the ground is based on an evaluation of each indicators that you have used as well as the way that you want to give to all of them so i would say that it's always good to have such practices that will allow us to enrich also the way that we collect such information and the way that we give to practice. And I would also encourage to share more of them so that the, 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 the proposal, the methodology that we're, that we're just, let's say, explaining now can be implemented and can also be understood how it is actually modified to meet the reality on the ground. So thanks very much, Roger, for your, for your approach. And I hope that this replied to your question. But if not, feel free to tell me and I will be more specific. And if I may add also, is it okay? Please, Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so actually we here we're not taking the uh, max, in, uh, mass, max spin. We're not taking the indicator with max spin. We are taking the average. So it is a composite severity actually. So you see we, here we have four indicators, so we're taking the average. So this is the composite severity. So this is in line with, the, with your methodology, okay? So to, uh, to, um, to not go through the risk of having overestimated pin. But we are just saying use mean of max 50, like if you have more than four indicators, imagine like if you have like six indicators or eight indicators then, you need like half of uh, six is three, half of eight is four indicators. So it, your final severity will be a composite of the severity from four indicators. So it's never linked to one indicator, okay? So this is, I think it's in line with your methodology. It's just like, just you need to distinguish when to use max of uh, 50%. It's not to choose the max between like one or two or three uh, indicators. No, if you have like, um, like a significant, like large number of indicators, so it's better to, to consider half of them. And this is usually used for the intersectorial. We just uh, mention it here to let you know that is an option in case you have many indicators, but this is usually not the case for GDD. We have between three and five, and you can simply take the average of the five, uh, which represents the composite uh, severity. Hope it's clear. Um, I think we need to stop here because we still need to have uh, to cover uh, method B, and we, if we have time, we'll we'll take more questions by the end of the presentation. Okay. I think that makes sense, Rofan. I think let's move to method B. Okay. It will be easier now that we've understood method A in more detail. But yeah. Thank you very much again, Ayoso, for the well explained. Um, um, method and then I think this should be easier as you said Astrid because uh, there are some steps shared with method A which already covered so we'll try to be quick here. So method B ideally you can use it with any data set like if you have only area level data set or you have area with one or more um, house, uh, household level data set so you can uh, use method B. Uh, the idea of uh, behind method B is about determining the uh, severity at area level for each indicator first, and then you aggregate. Uh, for illustration purpose, we will use this example. Here we have four indicators. One of them is at household level. We have the percentage of households engaging in negative coping mechanism, and you see the thresholds are at household level based on the number of uh, coping strategy. And then we have the second one, it's about uh, access to specialized reproductive health services. It's a key informant, so at area level. So the output will be 1%, one percentage uh, for one severity score, okay? And uh, the third one is on the presence of protection concerns or GDD risk factors for women and girls in the area. This also the source is um, area um, data set, key informant. It can be protection monitoring or DCM. And here it doesn't give you, the thresholds give you um, one severity score per area. It doesn't give you proportion of household, rather you get, it gives you how many um, risk factor uh, present in each area. And then based on the number, you can, um, you know, uh, code it, record it to, uh, to, to use severity score. Uh, the threshold, again, you can develop your threshold the way you feel it's uh, 
fits your context. You can use number of risk factor or the type of risk factor. It's totally up to you. The last one is on prevalence of child marriage and the, the source is MOSA. It's the area uh, level um, from area level data set. And as you can see with the threshold, um, give you proportion of households that can fall under one of the severity scores. So, uh, and then this can be um, one percentage that can be translated to severity score. So this is only an example to explain method B. So the first step, you need to prepare uh, the household and area level data for all indicators uh, the same, um, in the same way explained in method uh, A. So you take uh, one indicator at a time and you start to uh, calculate the severity at area level. So let's start with indicator A, the percentage of household reported engaging in negative coping mechanism. You will have this data at household level. Okay, you do the recording. So you translate the response from MSNA to a severity score, and then you aggregate at area level for each population group. So, so the output will be as shown here in this table. You will have one percentage per severity uh, score. Okay, because this comes from household level data set. So now to calculate the severity uh, for these indicators at area level, we apply the 25% rule. And this is recommended in the uh, um, uh, guidance. So how, how it works, you start from severity score five and you start to add up the, percent, the percentages until you reach minimum 25. So here it is 11 plus 25, that is 36, which is um, uh, greater than 25. So here we need to stop and take severity four. So the severity for uh, area A for IDP implant is four, okay? Because we reached 25% at severity score four, so we take four. For second one, again, we start with the severity score five. We have 6% plus 11%, that is 17, plus 37, that is 54, which is um, now we, we reach, um, we pass 25%, so we stop here, so the severity will be three and so on, okay? So you calculate uh, the severity uh, per area from uh, household uh, level data set, okay? So you repeat this for all household um, level indicators. And in our case, we have only one indicator. So the final output from, for, for this indicator will be the one severity score for each area per population group. If we have like 20 area, two population group, then we'll have like around 16 severity score. So the difference between this methodology and the previous one, we, we don't stay at household level. No, we, we, even if we have household, we aggregate to area level. So we get the severity for each indicator. The second indicator, it's um, area level. So we don't have the data at household. So it, we stay at the area level. And according to the thresholds, we should have one percentage uh, for one severity score. So it's, uh, again, the indicators is about uh, access to specialized reproductive health services. So if the assessment is area-based and it asks how many, um, you know, uh, what, uh, how, what, uh, how, how many households have uh, access to these services and they tell the, the, the assessment tells you that, okay, around 90% um, actually no access. So we put it under severity score five according to the threshold. Here, if the percentage is greater than 40, then it falls under severity score five. So we have 90, then the severity will be five. Second, um, the uh, second population group, ITP of camp, they reported 19% of a household with no access. So this is according to the threshold, you see, it is um, severity score two. So we, we, we do this uh, recording, each percentage will, will translate it into a severity score according to the thresholds. We do the same for the indicator number three and four, okay? And num indicator number three uh, was about presence of protection concern or GBV risk factors for women and girls in the area. And we have the threshold, the threshold, you know, based on number of risk factors, it, it doesn't give me 
um, you know, percentages of household. It's only tell me how many risk, uh, uh, how many risk uh, in the area, and based on the number, I decide the severity. So, for example, here we have, uh, if we have like three risk, then the severity would be four. If we have two, uh, or we, if we have, um, sorry, if we have uh, three risks, we have uh, the severity four, and then if we have two risks, then the severity will be three. You need to follow the threshold. For the fourth indicators, prevalence of child marriage, this is area-based, and the, according to the threshold, we will be able to get one percentage per area, and we need to, to translate this percentage uh, to a severity score using this threshold. So. If uh, we have uh, here, for example, three, that means the, the output percentage was between uh, 10 and 19. Here we have four, that means the percentage was between 20 and 30. So you just need to do this process for each indicator. Once done, you need to list all indicators in the same row for the area and population group. Okay, so you see here the indicator severity class. Uh, indicator two severity class here, the indicator three and four. And then uh, we take the average if we have uh, four indicators or less. If we have more than four indicators, we take mean of max 50. Again, forget about mean of max 50 here because we have only four indicators. So we aggregate the score, we come up with a composite severity score for this area or this population group. Here, we have uh, four, 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 three. So the aggregated one, the average will be four. We do the same for all uh, area and population group. And then we need to verify the finding with expert judgment. So we um, share this findings with all, uh, with all key members, with our coordination team at the you know, national, subnational level. And uh, we can also engage other AORs protection colleagues as well to look at the um, uh, output severity at area level. And if you have other data sources, like even if it's not representative, but if you have thorough assessment for particular area, you can verify with, with the finding as well to make sure that the severity, the output severity uh, reflects the reality. Because again, you know, data collection can, can um, uh, come up with a lot of issues, not always the data uh, is uh, of good quality. So we always need to uh, verify with other data sources. So if like experts decided that four is low and the, sever the risk severity is higher, so they, they should be able to adjust it and, and, and translate it into uh, higher severity, which is here uh, five. And the same for, for each of the rest, you know, you would revise the severity and then you can adjust it. Once this is um, finalized, we have we need to translate the output severity into team figures. So the output so far we have one severity which per area, which is very useful if you do severity ranking for area. So you say like, okay, the severity of this um, area might be higher than the other area. So you, this this severity can be useful, but it doesn't tell you the magnitude. Uh, you know, of the people in need. You don't have the people in need, which, which is a requirement. You need to, to come up with an estimate of people in need. So um, there is two ways to do it. The first way is um, protection method. It's uh, using severity pin conversion table. So um, again, in consultation with the GBB AOR key members, the expert judgment, you start to decide on the percentage of affected population in need for each severity score for each population group. So here, if we have three um, identified population group, IDP in camp, out of camp, and host community, you need to, to decide the, the conversion between the severity and PIN for each one. So here we decide, for example, and for, uh, for IDP in camp, severity score class five, we'll take 90% of the um, affected population. If it is four, we take 75. Three, we take 60. Two, we take 15. You do the same because again, out of IDP out of camp, usually um, they are, uh, you know, it's uh, the priority usually is IDP in camp. That's why the, the proportion is higher. So you can, this is only an example again, you can um, based on 
your consultation with your members. You can decide on this. Try to um, to have the same discussion with other uh, protection AORs and try to agree to, to have the same um, percentages for all. So once you decide on your um, conversion table, you need to use it um, to convert the uh, produce severity at area level to um, pain. So simply, now we have the affected population, for example, for this area, IDP camp, we have 10%. So uh, go back to the conversion table here, five, that means we need to take 90%. So you multiply 10,000 by 90%, and this is your initial figure. This is still not GBV 10, because we still need to apply the sad um, flex and edge uh, this aggregated percentage. So you get 9,000. Same with the um, uh, you know, next um, population group, IDP out of camp. Here we have severity four. So you check the IDP out of camp, uh, out of camp table. So four, that means you need to take 65%. So you multiply 50,000 by 60% per, uh, and you get 52,500. Uh, you do the same for the rest. So you get, you get these um, uh, figures. And now for DBV10, you start to take the uh, proportion for each age and uh, gender group. We agreed that we're going to take the 100% of men, of women. So out of 9,000, we have the proportion 25% are women, so we multiply 25% with 900, and we will get the number of women, uh, you know, in need of GBV services. Same for girls, 100% girls, so you take girls, 25, multiply by 9,000, and you'll get the number of girls. For men, uh, this is also, uh, again, uh, an example. We agree to take 20% of men. So, we take the 9,000, you multiply by 30, this is all men, and then you multiply by 20 and you get 540. Boys, the same, we agree to take 15%. So you take um, 9,000 multiplied by the 20% to get the total number of boys, and then you take 15%, you multiply by 15% to get the number of boys in need of GBV. At the end, you sum up uh, the four figures to come up with the total GBV team per area, per population group. This is the final. Once you again, sum them up, you get the total here, and you have the figure disaggregated by the um, by um, sad percentages. Okay, so this is one way. This is the uh, recommended approach by GPC and child protection as well to do to translate the severity class into pain calculation. Now, if you want to have more accurate figures, there is another way to do it, which is um, recommended by um, GF Data Scenario B. It's uh, mainly, um, you know, uh, to calculate initial figures for pain. To, uh, for each area and uh, population group to guide expert judgment to determine the pain within a range. Okay, so you have um, the severity class first, uh, the severity class for each area. You can then uh, come up with a um, mean max pin and then uh, show it to the expert. You know, you show all of these figures to the expert and then uh, like collectively you decide what figures to uh, take uh, from the um, you know, estimated range. How to come up with the mean and max? Again, we since 25% rule was used to determine uh, the severity class for each area, you can use it to determine the minimum pin under um, the severity score. Let, let's take an example here for area A, IDP and camp, the severity is five. So you multiply 25% with 10,000 to get 2,500. So this is the minimum number of people in need under Severity score five. You remember that for severity, we take uh, severity score three plus four plus five. So if we have 25% under five, that means we still uh, might have some percentage under four and three, and, and for sure our pin will be greater than 25%. For uh, this, um, uh, the area A IDP out of camp, we have the severity score four. Again, you multiply the 50 
thousand is twenty five percent. You got twelve thousand five hundred. So the minimum, like minimum of people falling under severity five and four, is uh, twelve thousand five hundred. That means you might have more under four plus some percentage under three. So the minimum will be um, twelve thousand five hundred. The third, um, you know, uh, row here we have severity um, uh, four three. That means 25% uh, fall under five plus four plus three. You might have exactly 25% and or more, but the likelihood to have more than 25% uh, is less than the case of four or five, okay? Because now you reach severity score three until you get 25%. So I know this is, might sound a little bit complicated, but there is you know, some <laughs> logic behind it and maybe later, when you have more time and look at the guidance and some examples, you, you'll uh, better um, you know, understand it. But this is the whole idea about it. Here, severity score two, that means uh, you reach 25% where you are under severity score two, meaning that the maximum 25% fall under four plus uh, five plus three. Okay, so this, this figure actually is the max. So European cannot exceed uh, 25,000, uh, okay? So this is the logic behind it. Now, um, to improve uh, or facilitate the process of uh, expert judgment, you can produce more figures to support or guide uh, the expert judgment. So now, if you have indicators that produce, um, you know, a proportion of households uh, under severity score or percentage of households, we call them magnitude um, indicators, then you can calculate PIN for each of those indicators. In our example, we had, um, if we go back to our indicators very quickly, we had um, three indicators, indicator one, um, three, and four. We have these indicators um, uh, which are able to produce percentage of um, household under severity score. So we go, you remember here, we can calculate PIN for these indicators. You take this percentage under four plus five, uh, five plus four plus three, and then you multiply it by the affected population. You can calculate the, the, the PIN for this indicator. Same with uh, indicator uh, two and indicator uh, four. So here is the, ta the table, you see, which is for the PIN per indicator. And then you take the max across uh, those indicators. So we let's take the uh, max pin. Um, yeah, so here we take, here we have the 9,000 is the max here, etc. Then you present all of these figures to the experts, okay? And you decide collectively um, on the final uh, pin, okay? So we say, okay, minimum it's um, 2,500, but these indicators and try to list, explain all indicators as well. And then you decide um, on the last uh, figures per area. Once you decide, you apply the sad percentage, same way in the previous step. We don't need to repeat it. Okay, so you apply the, um, the sad percentage and you come up with the total GBVP. Okay, so there is, this is another way. If you are interested, if you are keen to produce more accurate data and have some more rational behind your calculation, so this also is available. You can consult the GF guidance that a scenario will be to learn more and see more examples how it is used. But it is um, just for your information, it is an option that you, um, you can um, use. So now we've, we've done the last step similar to um, method uh, A. You need to validate uh, your uh, output with the overarching protection team and the intersectorial team through joint analysis. Ideally, the GBV team should not uh, exceed the um, uh, protection or intersectorial team. In case um, this happens, you need to highlight area of discrepancies and you discuss it through joint analysis if you, uh, if to the uh, intersectorial analysis team. So they can, if they are convinced, they can lift the intersectorial uh, pin. If not, then you might uh, opt to reduce your pin for 
those specific areas. Again, you don't need to rework the whole methodology. It's good to double check to make sure that all calculations are correct. But if you come up with the same findings, then and then you verify with experts with other data sources that your findings make sense. So you can uh, keep your uh, your findings. You say like, okay, because this is based on strong evidence, so we prefer to keep it. And then the analysis team can decide uh, again either to lift or you need to document that we reached this agreement and we have different severity for those uh, for those areas and you can document it. So you can um, you can do that as well, but try to come up with some agreement you know uh, to uh, to to resolve these discrepancies so that's it so we reached the last step in method b and um, just general tips during the uh, calculation regardless of the methodology you use sometimes uh, indicators cannot uh, show a, you feel like it's strong indicators but when data comes you know it doesn't uh, show variation in severity um, across different areas uh, and population group. So it's better to drop it out from your calculation. It's never let, you know, so again, uh, we, we think something and the data come, sometimes the data is not good. Sometimes it's, uh, you don't understand what happened. It doesn't make sense. So it's better to drop it uh, from your calculation. Uh, again, if the findings uh, for specific areas doesn't reflect the reality, if you have like situation analysis, if you have reports coming from your, uh, you know, subnational teams and the final output doesn't really um, speak to the reality, then you need to use uh, your judgment to adjust these uh, figures. It's fine. Because again, the purpose of the data collection data is just to initiate the discussion, to have something to work on it. But it's not, doesn't mean that, that they are accurate or really represent what is, uh, what is happening. Uh, last tip, it's about the uh, you know, consistency with the protection scheme, the structural scheme. It's very important to do this um, cross-checking and make sure that your findings is aligned with the intersectoral, even other sectors. If there is no common, like try to use the same baseline, uh, try to use, uh, if you're using uh, indicators from other sectors, try to use their threshold so the final uh, output will be in line with their uh, findings as well. And again, the, any, some adjustment can be done manually. It's totally up to you if you have um, a strong justification uh, for, for it. So that's it for the methodology. I hope that now you have the full picture and we promise to share the detailed guidance and with some Excel examples soon, within uh, maybe maximum by the end of the week to help you um, understand it uh, more. Now, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to jump in. We have um, one from work. Yes, my hand is up. Thanks, uh, Yoso. Uh, once again, thanks uh, for the presentation. Excellent. Um, I actually have a question on behalf of Fulvia, who just uh, left uh, this meeting. She's in another one. Um, so she was asking if uh, for the specific indicators we have right in the GF uh, reference table, if uh, there are also uh, possibly questions already related for these indicators, like how these should be asked, uh, for example, in an MSNA um, is, is there any guidance on, on that, how these questions should be phrased during the data collection? Over. Thank you very much, Ward. I think we shared the guidance with you. Uh, I'm not sure, like it was two months ago. Some examples uh, of uh, questions that, we ca that can be asked in MSNA. So we'll share it again. It's included in the, um, in the uh, PowerPoint and the guidance. And we'll ah, okay. Sure okay, we'll good. It. And it is all evolving, by the way. So we still there is a lot of work we need to do, but it's it's it it has some uh, good examples. Okay, sounds good. And, and um, some guidance as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from my side, I also have uh, questions. So number one is is again, if imagine if you could apply both methods, right? Although it's context specific, I know, and then most likely it will just be one of the two. But which method would be most recommended, A or, or B? Um, and then another, um, another question 
I had, um, okay, I, I, it slipped my mind. <laughs> Sorry, please, uh, yeah, just go ahead with this first one. If it's, if it's best to, to use method A or B. Well, um, actually, uh, we're not, like, it's very difficult to recommend. You need to check what is the methodology followed in with, um, by protection colleagues at intersectorial and try to pick the one that is close to the, their methodology because by doing so, you ensure that your findings will be uh, aligned with, the, with their findings and you'll, you'll, um, you'll, you'll save yourself from a lot of work and trouble. So have this discussion with the protection and other AORs, see what is the methodology that is followed at intersectorial level, and then you can decide. And it's again, based on the indicators and data sources. Like if you have only area-based um, uh, indicators. So I think uh, the only option is to follow method B. But if you really have very uh, strong representative um, uh, household level data set, it's, um, it's, 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 it's wise to utilize this because it's much easier. It makes more, more sense. But uh, I promise you that at the end, you, you will need to do some tweaking. This is your sectorial thing. So there, there is no limitation. And, um, as long as you know what you're doing and you're doing a, a consultation with all member and you are transparent in the process. So yeah, so it's totally up to you. And, and again, always check with other, um, with OCHA, intersectoral uh, approach and protection. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Okay, my other question that I just forgot was, um, it's about the expert judgment. So it is a little bit arbitrary, right? So is there any way um, yeah, you as, as, the, as the global AOR would suggest how to guide these discussions. Um, I don't know, a group of experts sitting in a circle and then just deciding like, yes, no, this should be one severity scale up or down. Um, do they need to kind of justify it? I don't know, maybe provide evidence or, or something yeah. to, to document how they're actually coming up with their uh, decision. Over. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rod. Very important question. So experts? You are the first expert. You know, the IMOs and the coordinators, co-coordinators, the coordination team is the first uh, expert. And you work on the data so you can understand it more. And your uh, responsibility as well is to uh, map all available data, even if it's not representative. So you use the representative data sets to produce the initial figures, but you need to also map all secondary data review and make sure that all information is available for experts to come up with the final conclusion, okay? So it's not about sitting and, okay, this is the severity, let's discuss, no. You have your, you need to make sure that all information is available. Uh, if you have like a team at subnational level, they usually, you know, through the monthly reporting, they, they have also uh, input uh, that can help deciding on the uh, final uh, severity. So invite everyone. Uh, make sure that everyone will have access to the available information and then you decide based on, based on that. It's not an easy uh, process, uh, but um, it's possible. And uh, yeah, again, national, subnational level will be good and try, with it, try to, to do it um, jointly with the protection as well. Okay, good. And I also see in the chat uh, some messages relating to this discussion. So that's also really helpful. Thanks yeah. a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Rofan. I don't know if there are other questions. I see we've actually managed to keep the majority of you still here going over the two hours. So I think that's a, a great sign. But I don't know if there are any other uh, last minute questions. then scream, raise your hand. Um, from my side, while I look, if there are other questions, I'd like to say a big thank you to Rofan and the whole IM team. And remind you, yes, the, the key resources will be made available as Rofan and everyone has told you. And the, the GPC is sending out a message on field support in the next days, like a joint statement or joint guidance. And I'd like to maybe just use one minute to talk about that because uh, they have put the upper system of focal points and what they expect from focal points 
uh, for field support is actually in case you have issues that needs to be raised with OCHA, in case there are issues that really require uh, a better collaboration across AORs and protection, where you think it can help you to get global or regional teams on board, then the GPC will have a focal point system. But for us, we're fortunate to have the regional teams, um, and I think you all know them, otherwise reach out to Rufan or me or, or any of the Riga team leads, you, you have your support system. And, and I think those remain your main point of contact on technical support. So just to avoid the confusion about the focal points, the focal points would be if you have a red flag that you want to be raised through the GPC. Otherwise, your field mm -hmm. support remains uh, through the AOR and the Rigas and the global team. Uh, and I think it's really good to see because I think we actually have very, very strong field support available for you guys. And, and I think, of course, there's a lot of, of uh, progress that have been made by all of you in the field. And then the very last that I think we always um, need to remember, which goes into the next uh, GPC forum on the HRPHNO, you know, with all the, the, the good points from Rofan around expert judgment and triangulation of data and, and, and that this is a joint process, I also want to really push to say that we are understanding that the IEM and the coordination, the strategic decision making about what indicators, why we use what indicators, you know, how to maneuver all these, press, these processes and the importance of being in the room of having a political presence is, is why we're so happy that we have coordinators and I am, and we're trying to bring you all together because these are not in a way separate fields. You might bring different skill sets to the coordination teams, but both are strategic and both are really about that technical, strong political engagement as well for us all to succeed. So with that, looking at the time, um, I'd like to just say a huge thank you for everyone who's stayed online for two, more than two hours. An enormous thank you for Rofan. I know you worked uh, through the weekend and last week, and there's been a lot of work going into this. For me, it's much clearer. I hope that for all of you online, the, the PIN and the severity and the GF and the actually agreed indicators are also much clearer for everyone. So a huge thank you. and. Uh, Take good care and I wish you a very good uh, week ahead. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.